Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about DA Mike Schmidt rethinking his stance on Measure 110, the Portland Police Union's latest attempts to tank the voter-approved police accountability board, and some more drama surrounding Oregon's bottle bill and bottle drop locations, this time involving my neighborhood. Joining me on this week's Friday News Roundup are CityCast Director of Digital Strategy, Brian Vance, and our very own producer, Julia Fiaioni. It's Friday, March 1st. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Welcome, everyone, to the Friday News Roundup. Brian, Julia, thanks for being here. Hey, Claudia. Thanks for having me back. Hey, thank you. Brian of Montevilla. Yeah, um, that's, you know, that's what I'm known <laughs> as in these streets, Brian of Montevilla. <laughs> <laughs> Before we jump into the news... For all of our new listeners, today is the day we break down some of the biggest local stories of the week with some of the best and brightest journalists in town. But before we jump into the news, I like to take a little detour and ask our guests an opening question so people listening at home can get a sense for who's in the room. So, Brian, yesterday, Julia and I had the pleasure of hosting a fellow colleague visiting us from Chicago, one of our marketing ops, Mariah McBride. And she came over with the sole purpose of grabbing some video, but in true Portland form, of course, it's been pouring right <laughs> the entire time. Mm-hmm. So last night we were like, well, let's take her to Huber's Cafe. She could at the very least have like a Spanish coffee and like, that's a cool video, right? So Yeah. Yeah. Seeing them make that for you. That'd be a fantastic video. Also, Julia had never gone. Yeah, it was my first time. Brian, have you been in Huber's? I don't drink coffee, so no. For yeah, city cast, so. they also do decaf. Just throwing that out there. Coffee so, just tastes like burnt rubber. It's it's gross. Ooh. Like it's so bad. It's so so bad. Brian, I know, and I live in like one of the coffee capitals of the world. God, we're, yeah. we came out swinging with controversy <laughs> today. We haven't even gotten to the headlines, and Brian's already going to blow up our fucking. Well, there inbox. you go. You have your episode title. Brian and Montevilla says coffee sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Montevilla would say coffee sucks. So anyhow. All of that um, made me wonder, what is a place that you have to take your friends to when they visit town or else you feel like they didn't, you know, like you didn't do Portland justice? Immediately the Coffin Club. I just had this experience recently with a friend who visited from LA and I think I just get a sick kick out of their reaction as soon as they walk in. Where they're like, what is this place? I've never seen anything Mm. like this. And I'm like, that's exactly why you're here. (laughs) But it's also just a really fun time. Um, I did this thing last time my parents were here. (laughs) That was kind of stupid. I took them up to uh, Rocky Butte in the middle of summer. Because I think like seeing the sunrise from up there is just, is totally beautiful. Like it's this old park that uh, was built during the, the FDR administration Um, on top of one Mm -hmm. of our many extinct volcanoes. It is like mosquito heaven in the summer, which makes no sense. There's no water there. Um, (laughs) But it was awful. Like everyone got bit like dozens of times within like 20 minutes there and we left. So uh, I can't do that one anymore. So maybe, maybe Mount Tabor um, would be my thing. Because again, Mm. you know, like it's that's what I love about this place is is the trees, is the mountains, is, you know, Mm -hmm. all that fun stuff. So. Agreed. Also, you get that beautiful view, you know? Yeah. Well, if anyone listening has a suggestion for opening questions, feel free to send it over to portland at citycast.fm. All right, on to the news of the week. Brian, what story caught your eye this week? Well, uh, everyone's been talking about this for a while, but the people are fed up with Measure 110. Uh, Politicians in particular Mm -hmm. are fed up with Measure 110. And Lucas Manfield in Willamette Week had some interesting news this week. Uh, Our... Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt has now come out in favor of recriminalizing drugs. The man who famously ran on a platform of we can't return to the failed war on drugs has kind of thrown mm. in the towel. I mean, it's it's just interesting to see how all the ducks are lining up here. And it it seems like even though this isn't what anyone really wanted back in 2020, when both mm-hmm. Measure 110 and Mike Schmidt, you know, were were on the ballot and both won their elections handedly. It's just, it's fascinating to see how we've wound up in this situation where he might be on the way out. Um, Measure 110 might technically be on the way out. Yeah. It's just like the whole thing is just messy. It's just really messy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess my question for y'all, did you expect him to come out in support of recriminalizing drugs? And do you think it'll actually help him? 
because it seems to be a strategic move on his part, you know, oh, like reading for sure, reading the tea yeah. leaves, seeing that like this is a losing battle, mm -hmm. so coming out in favor of it. But do you think it's enough to actually help him keep his job? That's a good question. And I think you're absolutely right. Like I, I looked into it and as of the end of February, he had like $200,000 less in um, campaign funding than his opponent, Nathan Vasquez. His employee. So, so. And his employee, employee yeah. important note. And in that context, I am not surprised. But if you would have asked me a few months ago, I would be very surprised. Ooh. So what's interesting is literally days before he came out in favor of this, he got his biggest contribution to his reelection campaign yet from the drug policy reform group mm -hmm. that was behind oh, yeah. measure 110. So. Yeah. yeah. I wonder how they're feeling about that 30 K. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I totally respect when people change their minds and I 100%. think that's actually a good thing. Maybe rethinking like your perspective, assessing new information, all that. I feel like we should encourage more of that rather than like, you know, dinging people for that in public offices. But I mm -hmm. do wonder, as we've been discussing how much of this change of heart has been motivated by the upcoming election. And because if this is how he feels in his heart of hearts, cool. Like, but I right. like more words, please. Like, what is his rationale? Because if he's just appeasing, you know, harsher penalties because he's, as you said, reading the tea leaves, I worry about that. Because once you start losing your own personal moral compass, like whether it's right yeah. or wrong in other people's point of view, that usually leads to shaky leadership. Well, yeah, because you're you're not necessarily invested in it the way that, uh, you know, you would be if it was something you truly bought into. And yeah, exactly. it's important to say that, like, as an elected official, I don't think you should lead <laughs> just from, like, your personal <laughs> feelings, your personal beliefs. Like, you are elected to represent the public. And so sometimes exactly. you do need to uphold policies or, you know, make rules that you don't necessarily love. But, like, that is what the public has has elected you to do. I do think that this whole conversation about recriminalizing drugs has missed a, a massive step here which is that like when we passed measure 110 what we did was we decriminalized possession of hard narcotics so things like fentanyl heroin meth with the idea that law enforcement and the entire state would push people towards treatment instead of punishment right. and mm -hmm. now as we're still trying to to figure out how to make this work we're we're basically flipping the switch back and saying okay let's go back to punishing but Mike Schmidt was actually a few months ago promoting this alternative approach to dealing with 110, which would close the loophole that is allowing people to consume those hard drugs in public. So we never mm. really had a law against consuming hard drugs in public because oh, yeah. it was illegal to possess them. So the idea was, well, you possess them. So if you're consuming them, we just get you on possession. It's frustrating to see that, like, it doesn't seem like anyone's really considering that option, like closing mm. that loophole um, before just kind of reversing three or four years worth of work and, and going back to where we were a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I have a different perspective on this because I I moved here from Toronto where they have uh, safe drug use sites. Yeah. And my first question when people have been starting to shift the conversation towards let's penalize public use versus just focusing on penalizing possession was, okay, now, where are these people going to go? Using drugs in public, in many cases, many of these people just don't have homes. So this situation turns into more of a conversation about, again, further criminalizing poverty yeah. rather than talking about drug use itself. So I was curious about this because I was almost in like disbelief that in Oregon, there isn't options for safe use sites just yet. You, you would think so, so I got, right? You would think so, right? I was like, is this actually true? So I got on the phone with someone who actually works at uh, what is basically like one step down from a safe use site here. It's a harm reduction site that provides like a needle drop mm. and exchange and other resources, Narcan training, uh, but you're not allowed to use the drugs on site. And I was talking to her and immediately when I was asking these questions about like, what's going on? How are you feeling about 110? And she got pretty emotional about it and talking about how she's started to cry over this situation and how frustrating it is to see things rapidly reverse because in the position that she's in, she's having people show up who don't have homes, um, trying to take care of themselves, using these proper resources, and then saying, hey, go three blocks down the street near the freeway so you can use, and then I'll run out to reverse the effects of your overdose when someone comes running in worried about you dying three blocks away from our site. 
which is like a part of this that I think um, is hard to talk about because there just isn't the infrastructure there to support these mm-hmm. types of shifts no. and reversing this policy in this way. And um, it's something that we should continue to keep an eye on. Like, it's not like, obviously, it's frustrating to see people using drugs outside, but we're really talking about housing here. Like, this mm-hmm. is what the issue is. Yeah. And mental health and and healthcare in general. And, and I go back to this conversation that y'all actually had with the CEO of uh, Central City Concerns, yeah. where he was talking about, like, the real issue here isn't that, like, drug use is new or drug use has gotten worse. It's that it's visible now. And for so many mm-hmm. years, it was happening in the dark. And so, like, that was the issue with the, like, well, let's criminalize public use of it is, like, it kind of still pushes us back in that direction. The real thing here is, like, lawmakers... Uh, state leaders still didn't hold up their end of the bargain with Measure 110. We still have some of the worst access to drug treatment yeah. facilities, mental health care, health care of any state in the country. And like, mm-hmm. no shade on the Deep South, but like, when you're down there with Mississippi and Alabama in rankings, like, that's not a good place to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, all shade to the South. So personally, <laughs> I'd love to get, uh, you know, Schmidt back on the show and just ask him how he's doing, you know, and just yeah. for the record, I'm all for making public drug use a crime again. <laughs> I, d- I never would. Yeah, I, mean, I something honestly has to didn't. Change. Yeah, I didn't mm. read the fine print. I'm, I'll be the one to admit. I'm like, I didn't read the fine print on what I w- voted on. <laughs> like, I yeah. feel like a lot of us were like Pikachu face shocked when we learned that's what that <laughs> meant. Like, we're just like, mm. arrest him. And we're like, measure once. And we're like, are you serious, though? <laughs> I thought it was just possession. I didn't understand the loophole. And I'd also like to remind everyone listening that over 70% of us voted for this dude. Yeah. Meaning his moral compass was our moral compass. So in Mm -hmm. a way, I'm also asking, how are we all doing right now? I feel like we're all doing a lot of reacting. And though I agree, like something needs to happen. A lot of terrible decisions can also be made when you're just reacting, you know? So, sorry, I took us down this philosophical road. Um, I had a Spanish coffee last night. Um, But it's a a good point, Claudia, is like, (laughs) he he was elected because I think a lot of people in Multnomah County agreed with what he was saying and Mm -hmm. and believed in what he was saying. And we're all kind of dealing with things that haven't gone the way we wanted to. So how, you know, how Mike's dealing with this could be a barometer on kind of the internal feelings that we're all dealing with right now. I know. Even though he is our sacrificial lamb, like we're just like, God yeah. damn it, Mike. God. Yeah. He He's good for a while. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, I'm working with what everyone gave me. <laughs> <laughs> He's just one piece of of the bigger puzzle, you know. I know. Like, well, that's God. true too. And and even when he was on the show back in August, he was talking about how there was a huge lack of defense attorneys. Right and state hospital resources for rehabilitation. So, I mean, what's different now? Nothing's changed. We haven't addressed that. Well, so that's the thing about this recriminalization effort. The Oregonian has done some reporting on some internal analysis that the state has done about like what this would cost and, you know, how many convictions it would result in. They're estimating at least 2200 additional drug-related convictions a year as a result yeah. of recriminalizing drugs. We still don't have enough public defenders for the current people getting arrested and charged. So until they address that, like we're just kicking the can down the road, which has always been the problem with the war on drugs is like we just kick the can down the road for a later administration, a later generation to deal with. And the problems just compound and we wind up with, you know, what Portland's been like for the past few years. Yeah. Mm hmm. Super depressing. Thank you so much, Brian. That was a bummer story to start us off with. I apologize. Yeah, I really loved it, though. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's what we're dealing with. I, I know a lot of us keep you know, just hoping that these little incremental changes help us with anything. But if you talk them through, you're just like, how is this changing anything? You know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, DA Mike Schmidt, hit us up. Come on. We want to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> also, I want to talk to Vasquez because I'm like, like <laughs> Sephora, like explain to me how what you're proposing is going to make anything different. Are you going to yeah. magically create more police officers and, and public defenders? Like I want to understand, you know, how th- all of this is going to work. Yeah. All right. Let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, more headlines of the week.
Before we get into Julia's story, I just wanted to point out that we've had an incredibly jam-packed week, which included us launching our membership campaign. Uh, we've been making this podcast every weekday now for over a year. You guys, did I like did the math? This is our 289th show. Oh my god, That's impressive. <laughs> That's crazy. So I was curious, like, do you guys have a favorite show you listened to or worked on? I don't work on the show, but as a listener, it's it's one of the earlier episodes y'all did with the bridge lift operator. It, oh, selfishly, yeah. this is a question I have had for years. <laughs> yeah. Is what do they do when they have to go to the bathroom? And CityCast Portland finally answered this question for me. And so I love that episode. Y'all recently re-ran it. I re-listened to it again. Mm. It's just a, a fantastic example of the kinds of like fun quirky stories that y'all tell on this show and selfishly you answered a question that has weirdly been burning in the back of my brain for like eight years so mm. thank you oh yeah of course brian of Montevilla. <laughs> what about you julia <laughs> that's really sweet brian thank you um Thinking back, this is quite a few months ago, but one of my favorite episodes to work on was when we had Mary Pavito from Neighbors for Clean Air on. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. think just to give some context, we talked a lot about how Portland's air isn't clean and there's a lot of diesel pollution for a number of reasons. It kind of just gets trapped here, but I think it just blew my mind to have that conversation mm -hmm. in a city where there's so many trees everywhere and it's um, very much branded as a place to go and escape pollution and yeah. to get out and enjoy fresh air. And it completely switched my perspective on the air that we are breathing and kind of like activated me personally to really care about those things. And I remember Claudia too, you being so surprised because some of the worst of it was in St. John's. <sighs> that did blow my mind. Mm -hmm. Did not know that. And it really was a bummer to find out that I'm in the epicenter of it. <laughs> no. Sorry to bring it up um, again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, just yesterday, Commissioner Carmen Rubio came on the show to explain what the hell is going on with the Portland Clean Energy Fund that everyone has been like, it's a slush fund or like, you know, or like, wow, you know, she's a maverick. And it's like, she was just like able to pull apart like, hey, man, this is what it is. This is how little I have to do with it. This is how much I have to do. And it was great. Like, mm -hmm. I still have some questions, to be honest, <laughs> but like. Which I know that she'll be following up on, like, because what we're providing is an ongoing conversation. Like, when you write in, right. like, no joke, Brian wrote in and was like, hey, what's going on with these bridge operators? And we're just like, uh, let's find out. Yeah. yeah. Like, we listen, we look into it, mm -hmm. we bring in the reporters who are working on those stories, and we try our hardest to see it from all sides. Also, not to brag, but reporters and politicians tell us that they love coming on this show <laughs> because they just get to be themselves, let their hair down, you know, talk their yeah. shit. Yeah. And that means that journalists lean in a little more into the stories that they're reporting on. Our city leaders can speak more candidly about the issues they're working on. We, we get all this extra bit of info that just doesn't make it to most media platforms. So, like, I don't think anyone's really doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to see us continue this work, especially now that we're approaching a very hectic election season and complete government overhaul, uh, oh, it's going to be chaos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> consider becoming a founding member. Head over to portland.citycast.fm, and if you join by March 8th, you will get your name on our site forever. We will. <laughs> Which is crazy, yeah. <laughs> Plus, I will no joke whisper your name on a hidden track that will then get placed in all of our shows moving forward. I'm not like fucking joking. I mm -hmm. will do it. I will film myself <laughs> I doing confirm. it. I will do Like, we've already planned. Like, who's recording this? Like, it's <laughs> happening. All right. Well, thanks for letting me talk my piece here. Julia, what are you looking at this week? So, my story is from Catalina Gaetan from The Oregonian. And they're reporting on how police accountability reform advocates are raising alarm bells about a Portland police union-backed ballot petition that's going around that would ask voters to weaken the city's planned civilian-run police oversight board if placed on the November ballot. So bigger picture, the change would be uh, essentially stripping the future board's power to discipline officers and shift its focus to helping the police bureau recruit and retain officers. 
But uh, I want to get into some of the context and the specifics Catalina laid out in their reporting. And I'm going to kind of lay it out in a list. But it's important to note that back in 2020, 80% of Portland voters approved of creating this new Mm -hmm. oversight board for things like investigating complaints of officer misconduct and disciplining officers as far as firing them when necessary. Um, But the ballot petition would change a number of things, including, so number one, putting the city's police chief, not the oversight board, in charge of making disciplinary decisions, removing a prohibition on former or current police officers from serving on the board, eliminating a requirement for the board's budget to be equal to at least 5% of the police bureau's annual spending, and removing a requirement that the board has members from diverse backgrounds, including those who have experienced systemic racism, mental illness, and addiction, and instead focus on including people of various professional backgrounds who live and have a job in Portland. So this whole petition, according to the president of the Portland Police Association Union, said that the union drafted the ballot petition based on results of a union-funded poll. Note that, union-funded poll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that poll. Oh, I, who, I, who's, who's, who's in that union again? Uh, police officers, most of whom don't (laughs) live in Portland, most of whom don't live here. Interesting. But that poll showed only 23% of the 500 respondents wanted to keep the oversight board plan as is. And hold on. I want to, I want to hug every single one of those 23, (laughs) 23% of the, yeah, whatever that is. 23%, like high five. Yeah. And the president also noted that he thinks the current oversight board plans went beyond what voters wanted and would make it difficult for the city to hire and retain officers. But what's interesting is that this petition would give the board responsibilities outside of the scope of what voters approved in 2020, things including requiring the board to produce two annual reports focused on recommendations for recruiting and retaining officers and police training, which just doesn't make any sense to me. It's n- how is that, that is not part of the accountability board. No. How is that about accountability? Mm-hmm. Like if you want a body to help you recruit, make that use your union yeah. funds to make that. But like, don't try to cowtail it into this thing. That makes literally no sense. Like quite like my head hurts right now. Oh, thinking yeah. about this. That makes <laughs> no freaking sense. Well, yeah, do you can you want to hear my theory? Please. Yeah. As to why they're really afraid of giving the committee the power to terminate employment and also this whole retainment, they don't have enough people to replace anyone going out. Yeah, the recruitment issue is real. It's mm-hmm. been a problem. Yeah, it is real. It's true. Yeah. So, I'm assuming that once this accountability board kicks in, there will be a reckoning with some of the officers that keep getting fined of us for excessive and deadly force. I'm not saying that. But Portland I'm does just, have a really bad track record when it comes to the DOJ and yeah. misuse of force, uh, you know, harassment, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not just that we have a track record. We have a paper trail yeah. with the United States government. Yeah. The federal <laughs> yeah. government. Like, yeah. Like, we've actually been fined. You know, here's the deal. The city is lacking funds right now. If you listen to that Rubio uh, a interview we did. crisis. Yeah. <laughs> she laid it out, you know. So they can't afford, like, the city can't afford to keep bailing out these bad agents in the police force. And if the police force thinks that's going to deter more officers from joining, that in itself is also an issue. Right. Like, you know? are those really the people that you want yes. exactly. as police officers joint like y- yes i understand as a police officer how frustrating it could be to hear a phrase like all cops are bad like i mm-hmm. understand especially if you are a police officer who's trying to do the right thing trying to serve and protect everyone trying to be fair so why would you want to let any bad apples into your organization and make your job harder and exactly. ruin your reputation, like, and also cost your organization more money and more resources, money that could actually go to, I don't know. Retention? Retention, getting new, <laughs> better benefits, uh, you know, recruiting more people so that you're not working 70 hour shifts. Yeah. Um, you know, like, it just doesn't make sense. And also this idea that we should let the body regulate itself, like, that makes no sense. Why would you crack down on yourself? Yeah, I also feel like this could be a hint of a smokescreen because you know how your head just hurt? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's there's an ulterior motive here, I'm sure. Well, once we have this accountability board, it means the police union would have less power. And mm-hmm. I think that is where reporters yeah. should be focusing some of their scrutiny. Yeah. It's 
always been about the police union. Am I the only one who watches Scorsese's films? (laughs) (laughs) I think the bottom line is the fact that they feel threatened by an accountability board is the problem. It shouldn't be threatening. It should be comforting. It should be something where you're like, nice, like, I don't have to keep track of that. Great. This is going to go so much more smoothly. But it's very telling that it is feeling like it's a threat. Well, something that stood out to me in the story was that the attorneys representing the police union brought up the notion, and I think you mentioned this, Julia, that they're what they're asking for is closer in line to what is, and they said this, constitutionally legal in Oregon, implying that the accountability board is skirting some of that, um, which doesn't make sense. And, and so I'm, I'm curious exactly what mm-hmm. they mean by that. Like, that's something I'd like clarification on. This is a quote from one of them. We want to make sure that our system is one that is not so novel that it creates significant problems for our members and for our community. Well, it's like lawyering at its finest. It's like just saying words in combinations that, you know, yeah. make something sound more complex and technical than it mm-hmm. actually is. So that you're like, oh, yeah, well, this person has a law degree, knows more than me, like this is probably true, but like they're not giving you any specifics. So what are they saying violates Oregon's constitution or the federal constitution? If it does, that should be very clearly pointed out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Part of me wants to shoot these two attorneys an email and ask like, what are you guys, like you're implying, spell it out. Like what is it? Stop hinting and just come out Spell and say whatever you want to say. say and if, it. <laughs> if that's if that's their fundamental issue with that that measure that passed back in what 2020 by 80 percent of Portlanders mm-hmm. in a city of contrarians, the fact that 80 percent agreed on anything is like we all deserve a gold medal for that, regardless of what it is. It's so true. But uh, if your issue is that like people didn't fully understand what is in there, then why are you being so unclear right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I will say they do have until July 5th to gather enough signatures for the petition. And in that case, if they do, it'll go on the November 5th ballot. But July 5th is quite a bit of time from now, so they very well could do it. Um, And the board is supposed to launch next summer. So lots of moving pieces. And I'm sure we'll continue talking about this. Do you think they're going to get those signatures now? I think it's going to go on the ballot, to be honest. Do I think it's going to pass? No. You can get anything on the ballot here. Like, it's really not that hard. Like, (laughs) passing it is a whole other measure. But, like, we almost passed a quote unquote sales tax on certain things a few years ago in Oregon. Well, we didn't almost pass. Sorry. It was on our statewide ballot. Like, you can clearly get anything on the ballot in Oregon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, Julie, thank you for looking into this. Um, Yeah. I'm confused. It's you know when you leave a story more confused. I'm just like, what? Well, it's just like what we were talking about a few minutes ago. This yeah. election season is going to be chaos. Like there's going to be so much to follow. Yeah, I know. Just a million little high fives to that twenty two percent. You're seen. You're heard. All right. Well, my story this week is actually a bit more direct reporting from me. If You're you listen to last, here. yeah, I know, man. If you listen to last week's Friday Roundup, you might remember that I somehow four scumped my way into every headline. <laughs> like, I'm yeah, somehow I had to get that always in there. there. Fantastic well, verb. Yeah, I was like holding a froze, getting wheeled into a hospital. <laughs> I know. I was just like, I was there. Well, this week, <laughs> several TV outlets picked up a story that a potential new bottle drop location would be coming to my neighborhood of St. John's. And it's actually been causing an uproar. It's like Mm. all that people are talking about when you go out into the world here. Because it's been reported, we've discussed this a bit too, it's been reported that crime around bottle drop locations tend to spike and spread to surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, This isn't speculation, by the way. This has also been recorded by the police. So I figured I'd look into it since we're, we've also been, you know, digging into Oregon's bottle bill and and how some city and business leaders are pointing out its connection with our city's fentanyl crisis. You know, we, we've also just been wondering what the hell is going on with the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative, and they're actually the ones that operate all of the Oregon bottle drops. So when this story started bubbling in my neighborhood, I obviously became intrigued. Yeah. Um, before I dive even deeper, what do you guys think so far? Why? I, I, I do not understand. Like, I, I understand we pay deposits on bottles. I like it. I think it's a great way to keep bottles out of the trash. Why can't you just take it back to the place you bought it? Like, mm-hmm. isn't that just the easiest, best solution? Like, if they are allowed to sell it and put it out there, shouldn't they be required to help facilitate getting it recycled? So why do we need a specific location? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they are actually, but they have to be larger than 5,000 square feet. 
because they're just like, you don't have the facilities for it. Because here's the deal, and this is, we're going to talk about it. At a certain point, you're a waste transfer station. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You're an industrial machine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's what these Oregon bottle drops are. They're they're like a trash place. So the troubling uh, aspect of, of this is that that location that they're choosing isn't even zoned for yeah. an industrial site which is what this would be, as we were just discussing, pretty much all of that area. And of course, uh, the main strip are residential neighborhoods, and they have a few clusters of smaller business districts. Right. And most of these small owner-operated businesses, you know, are also immigrant-owned. So St. John is actually considered one of the most diverse areas mm-hmm. in our city. And here's the deal with St. John's. Historically, it's been where lower income folks live, immigrants move to, and these smaller businesses reside. And I mean, like many places in town, it is gentrifying, as you know, Brian. Yeah. yeah. When you were shopping out here for a house. Couldn't get in there. <laughs> but the heart of its identity is still there. And that's why people are fiercely proud to be from yeah. St. John's and are also kind of protective. But all this could also be why traditionally it's been ignored by the city and it's kind of used as a Mm. dumping ground, Mm -hmm. like quite literally. Like I can smell the off-gassing of the BP natural gas silos a few times a month that are (laughs) located just across Cathedral Park. Why were they put there, guys? Why were they put there? Out of the way. It's so frustrating. And just to also further catch you up on like why people are worked up, in the past year, the city placed a safe rest village in the area, which honestly, not many people were upset by. But then a few months later, the city also announced they were putting up one of Wheeler's mass homeless campsites near a more industrial part off North Portland Road, but it wasn't properly vetted through the community. And that site is actually stalled from opening because the location is considered to be contaminated. Right. Also, Cotex 90-Day Fentanyl State of Emergency has chosen the North Portland County Clinic, which is located in the heart of St. John's, literally one block away from me, as the uh, main location for concentrated fentanyl rehab treatment. Mm. That happens every day, folks. Neither of these two proposed projects have kicked in, but it's clear they're coming. So once this Oregon bottle drop transfer way station kind of snuck into the neighborhood again without any discussion, (sighs) understandably, people got really, really, really upset. Oh, yeah. And Brian Cook, who owns Lombard House, that's a small neighborhood tavern located right near where that bottle drop facility is supposed to go, He actually had an email writing party this last Tuesday night. There was a whiteboard with all the names of our local representatives, you know, for the area and like $5 beer to keep you motivated. Um, Brian has actually been on the show. I don't know if you guys remember. He like he came on to talk beer. So, I yeah, I stopped by with my recorder to ask him how he was feeling about all this and just to like get a vibe of the room, you know, because I'm like, how mad are people? (laughs) Like, What's going on? And also, like, just so you know. St. John's isn't very NIMBY. Let me put it that like It's not very like, not in my backyard. It's just not. If right. anything, it's really like, I don't know. Like, who are we going to help? Like, what's going on? Yeah, for Portland neighborhoods, it's like very, very low on the NIMBYism. So. Yeah. So when people like Brian Cook, who, you know, most people see in our area as like, just being like, oh, man, what's going on? Like being a chill dude, just being like, no, this, I'm upset about this. I was like, oh, because he's been so vocal online. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, this is what he had to say. So when I was going to open this place, I knew, like, St. John's is St. John's. You don't buy your way in. You don't sneak your way in. You don't do anything surreptitious to come to St. John's. You come correct. You do your propers. And you introduce yourself to your neighbors. And they did none of that, as far as I can tell. They purchased the property in December. There was no public notice that I'm aware of. They seem to have done none of the proper preamble, and they haven't seemed to respect us as a community. What about the zoning issues? I, I, you were talking about the zoning, how it wasn't zoned correctly. I understand it's not currently zoned for a waste facility. I also know that they bought it for $1.8 million when it's assessed at $1.4. You and I wouldn't buy a house for $400,000 more just hoping zoning would be changed. So I find that like suspect at best and problematic most likely. I want to go on the record that I taught in juvenile detention and drug and alcohol rehab. I have family back home who struggle with all these issues, but this 
project seems like something that the city is just going to sneak into St. John's, ask us, you know, to chop all the wood, carry all the water, and the city does nothing. What about the other businesses, like, you know, with um, the Safe Rest Village, with the fact that the North Portland County Clinic is going to start being more consistent in their treatment of fentanyl addiction, and they're kind of basically centering it here in St. John's. What do you think this is going to do for local businesses in the area? Well, for me, I think the Safe Rest Village is an example of what works. We provide human beings with a place to lock, a place to feel safe, and I'm for that. That's a St. John's value. Um, as far as fentanyl treatment, I mean, my friend Mikey, his picture's up there, he... <laughs> he passed away from fentanyl. Like, I'm not anti-homeless people. But um, <clears throat> I'm against forcing my neighbors, especially my immigrant neighbors, who are called slurs on a daily basis, mostly by white men on drugs, to bear the burden. And as a 49-year-old white man in Portland, I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I would be, I'd be a coward if I didn't say anything. I would be. So I feel like, again, this is one of the situations where Portland pats itself on the back, but decency and a modicum of respect and the basic human contract have been abandoned, I feel personally, to protect everyone. There are takers and monsters in the world. And the biggest tragedy I see about how we've allowed this to go is that the mentally ill people, the drug addicted people, the homeless people that need our help are also being bombarded by the people that I'm concerned about running my friend down the street out of business. I sit here every day and I watch it. And I have the privilege of being six foot one and 210 pounds and a white dude. I'm not a 15 year old immigrant who's like trying to run his dad's store. And like, we can't just ignore those children. Like, it's crazy. Are you at all worried about your business and how it'll do once that bottling facility goes in? To a degree. I mean, yeah, I'm more concerned about my neighbors who immediately abut it. You know, Grocery Outlet is where people of not a lot of means shop. And the bottle drop at Delta Park is being attempted to be evicted. And that is not for nothing. And that is not in a neighborhood. It's in an industrial area. So, you know, the Ace Hardware, the Grocery Outlet, the St. John's Deli, all these businesses that are close to it. I'm more worried about them than I am about me. And also, like, I'm not going to be mad at someone who's, like, an addict for breaking a window. It sucks. But I don't hate that person. I'm not mad at that person. I'm mad at the state of Oregon for abdicating its responsibility for the mentally ill and the homeless by giving them this, like, fake allowance they give them with this bottle redemption. And they just act like everything's fine. And if you drive by that place, it's not and the people we claim to care about are the ones who suffer. And, you know, again, I pay for some of my groceries with Bottle Drop. A lot of very decent people use Bottle Drop. We have a functioning one at the Safeway that, unless I'm wrong, seems to work great. It's never overflowing. We have it. I feel very much like the city is trying to force the problems they don't know how to handle, even though they have millions and millions just sitting there that they misuse and waste. They want to force it on us. And it's bullshit. It's fucking bullshit. And again, that's just my opinion. And I hope there's people out there who disagree with me. And that's a good thing. But I just can't watch. I can't watch my friend down the street suffer anymore. And, you know, let's, we, I left out the fact that we're trying to end pedestrian deaths in Portland. And so we're going to add a pedestrian-driven major waste treatment plant on a two-lane highway that has no appropriate crossings. Again, Portland at its finest, right? We'll push the problem down the road, but let's make it on a busy road. And you know what will happen when those people get run over? The city and the state won't give a fuck because it's just some dude recycling cans. So what do you guys think? I mean, the big issue there seems to be the whole, like, sneaking around aspect of this. And I, I totally understand oh, yeah. being outraged by that, in, in all honesty, in a in a city that likes to talk about how transparent it is, Portland really isn't all that transparent when you get down to it. And this is a great example of how the state, the county and the city can kind of all work together to do things in secret that, you know, really do have an impact on, on the quality of life in a neighborhood. So, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, it's devastating to listen to just how much people in the area have already been affected by how out of hand things have gotten. And it's very frustrating that there isn't any sort of thought gone into the outcome of putting a bottle drop in this location. Like Brian pointed out with the pedestrian deaths, it, it's obvious that that would be the outcome. And that's something that we're dealing with and is a major issue only yeah. for for the sake of politicians being able to point to, hey, look, we put a bottle drop location there. Look, we're doing something to pat yourself on the back. It's It's really frustrating. Yeah. And just, you know, to touch on that, like, that area is so hard to navigate. Mm. Isn't it run by ODOT? Like it's and ODOT's it not famous for, <laughs> for prioritizing pedestrian access. Yeah. So I don't understand how that's going to um shake out. Like I just don't think it's I think it's a dangerous location for that spot. Also, it is a residential area. That waste facility is gonna smell. I'm talking about like the actual cans, the actual mm -hmm. process of what they're doing. Right. It's going to be noisy. It doesn't make sense why it would go there. Also, the latest homeless campsite that Wheeler is planning on making off North Portland Road is not even able to move forward because it's considered a waste site with too much contamination. Oh, yeah. Like the land is toxic. <laughs> Put it there. Yeah. Yeah. It is a waste <laughs> site. So It's a waste. Put it there. Also... The Oregon Bottle Bill was created to prevent littering. Because back yeah. in the 70s, back in the 60s, people were just like, I'm sorry, I don't understand how trash works. That's so so they would just throw that <laughs> shit out the windows. No, it was a problem. And so, yeah, Governor Tom McCall came up with this idea. Hey, man, let's charge them five, ten cents per bottle. And then uh, if they want that, they got to bring us their trash back. Yeah. And it was purely for litter. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't to subsidize social programs that our state and our city, like our all forms of government have just abdicated, you know? Yeah. It wasn't supposed to be that. And I'm speaking as someone mm -hmm. who used to collect bottles as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I like, did it as a kid. So like, it's not supposed to be this like safety net. You're also, it doesn't make sense to like, St. John's, one of the problems with St. John's has always been it's hard to get there. Yeah, It's exactly. hard to get to St. John's. It's hard to get out of St. John's. So why mm -hmm. are we putting vital resources that are supposed to serve the center of the city because they want to keep them there. Exactly. They want to move. They want to move all the like what they think is an eyesore out of downtown yeah. and into a place that, quite frankly, can't handle the load. We're too small. One hundred. And we already don't have enough support as it is. Well, I think this speaks to the issues that some of the Multnomah County commissioners had with this, you know, fentanyl emergency that was declared for downtown. Was this is not a downtown issue. This is not mm -hmm. a Portland issue. Mm -hmm. This is an Oregon issue. It affects every single part of this state. And so putting all of your attention on a tiny little geographic slice allows you to ignore or even exacerbate problems in other parts of, of our communities. And that's just so unfair to everyone. It's creating an imbalance. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I just love that Portlanders like to be like, man, we're so progressive. And I was like, oh, cool, you're still dumping on people of color, mm -hmm. right? lower income white folks, and, and migrants. Mm -hmm. Tight, tight folks, tight. You know, and it's, again, because like when you go to travel Portland, that's not where people go. They don't come to St. John's. No. And that is why I, I think it's we're that closet. I, I've mm. talked about it before. It's like, oh, you know, you have a mess in your house and you're like, ah, let's put it in the closet. Yeah. And then we'll sort through it. Later, but at least it's our house looks nice. It's going to be in the closet. Like, you guys, you can't do that. I, and I'm sure that when other neighborhoods heard that, they were like, Fee you. Right, right. I <laughs> Honestly, understand. I would too. Like, if this went to like any, I would be like, oh, just sorry about that, guys. <laughs> you know, but like, you guys, like, if you actually do care about all the values that you're holding up, this should maybe kind of piss you off a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I think. Brian talked about a bunch of different things in there, but it was it was clear to me his his bigger issue seemed to be like the way they're doing this. The fact that they're still not addressing the root causes of the things that make the bottle drop such a public eyesore and, and a contention point. And then the fact that the city, which still pledges Vision Zero, is planning to put something that most of the people who visit it will be walking or biking on a, <sighs> a highway, basically. Road. Yeah. And and their solution will be to put up a sign that says warning high crash intersection mm -hmm. and not actually do anything to fix it. Like 
that seems to be the heart of his issue. Yep. Like, yes, it has to go somewhere, but it can go somewhere that doesn't just make problems worse. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You have actual industrial areas in yeah. St. John's that could work for this. But as he also pointed out, there is a functional bottle drop already in the community. Yeah. Yep. It's safe. So why do you need another one? Is there actually enough demand? If not, then why are we even doing this? Yeah, they're centralizing everything in St. John's. Yeah, but also if you're just like feeling a little like, oh, these people, they're so nimby and you don't you don't know about St. John's, you don't know about the go to Delta Park and see the bottle drop there and see what it's done to that area. So the way that it's been patrolled, the way nobody cares about what's happening there. It was like a dumping ground for a lot of people who need services. And what ended up happening is the owner of that lot is suing. Wow is suing them to get out because they're tanking all the businesses around. Gotcha. Meaning they need a new location because that place is going to have to go. But meanwhile, they haven't addressed any of the root issues. Like there exactly. is nothing fundamentally wrong with a bottle drop. But if you know that you have issues with crime, if you know that you have issues with the way people are using the funds from it, like let's maybe slow down and, and tackle some of those first before we just kind of kick that can down the road, that thing that Oregon Literally. loves to do, just kick that can <laughs> yeah, down the road. Or recycle that can down the road. But here's the other thing. Ultimately, we don't need bottle drops for recycling. We recycle. Yeah. We recycle now. We don't need it anymore. With the but spirit of the bill, we got it. We yeah. have a recycling program. We don't have to even get charged. Like mm -hmm. We could just put them cans out and the city grabs it. And I wonder too, if there's a world where, like you said, Claudia, the purpose of the bill is not what it was and I feel like we could negotiate something where there still is that 10 cent fee, but it just goes directly into creating proper resources mm -hmm. for people who would be benefiting from the bottle bill. Social services. I feel like Portlanders could get behind that. Yeah. Why don't we just cut the in-between, you know, and clean up that mess and, and make it happen? Yeah, to outline what Julia just said, so the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative, the OBRC, manages the day-to-day -day of the Oregon bottle bill and own and operate all the bottle drops, but are weirdly not at all affiliated with the state, meaning where yeah. is all that money going to? Mm -hmm. Because I was, we just said, not everyone brings back their cans, mm -mm. you know? We, we Most of us just recycle them. So where is all that money going? Yeah. It's not going back to social services. It's going to the industry, you know? Mm -hmm. Like it's going to the people who make the products it's to begin with. It's a for-profit business. It is. And but again, you know, like we keep talking about these budget crises at the state level, at the county level, at the city level, rather than raising additional funds on top of this, let's just figure out how to more smartly. That's not a word, but it is in this case. <laughs> uh, let's figure out a better way to use the funds that we're already collecting. And this I mean, Julia's idea sounds like something that hopefully someone who's listening to this podcast. I mentioned it's really easy to get a ballot measure uh, <laughs> on the ballot in Oregon. Hopefully someone gets this on the ballot in Oregon, and we can change mm -hmm. how this bottle drop system works. So Ballot measure writing at, at the Lombard House, $5 beers. That's a party. Let's, <laughs> let's pitch it to Brian. <laughs> Brian Cook's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm here for the $5 beers. Uh, listen to CityCast. I heard there right. were some $5 beers here. Free beer tomorrow, always. So. Well, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me, talking through some of the stories of the week. And uh, yeah. Well, thank you for having me on again. And uh, it's always fun to, to chat with you. Thanks, Claudia. While we were taping our Friday roundup, Willamette Week's Nigel Jayquist published an article reporting that Governor Tina Kotek is suspending Oregon's bottle bill in force redemptions at the downtown Safeway on Southwest 10th and a nearby plaid pantry, meaning that now under the 90-day fentanyl state of emergency, there will be no can and bottle redemptions for those two stores only. And it's going into effect starting March 2nd through April 1st to be evaluated after a month, meaning, you know, who knows? So clearly, the powers that be understand what these drop-off locations mean to local businesses and neighborhoods. So why is an industrial-sized Oregon bottle collection and waste service center going into an already struggling and cramped residential corner of St. John's? Also, not sure if moving the problem around solves anything. Maybe it's time for real solutions. 
That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. Our executive producer is John Atariani. Our producers this week were Julia Fioni and Natalie Rivera. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, and our host is me, Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Trizos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound and All the Kimonos. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>